IB Nation, welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. It's a special Saturday edition because Notre Dame got some big news today. Anthony Saka has committed to the Fighting Irish, the standout linebacker from Pennsylvania. That's where he plays football. I heard the discussion yesterday, but he plays football in the state of Pennsylvania. This is one this this is one of those ones that's been a long time coming. I'm going to give a little bit of backstory on this commitment. And then I'm going to play the video. So Ryan and Sean yesterday interviewed Anthony Saka about his pending commitment. We obviously knew this one was coming. And so they sat down with Anthony. He explained what was going on and and why he made the decision. Just really, really uh, great interview. And and so I'll play that. And then when that's over, I'll dive into the class impact. I'll break down some film. I'm going to go back old school a little bit on this one, folks, and then obviously wrap up with a what's next. No mailbag today, so if you do have some questions you want me to answer, I'll go ahead and get those if they're super chats. Otherwise, we'll have those conversations on the message board. But this is a big one for Notre Dame. Obviously, this is a a recruit in Anthony Saka that Notre Dame has been on for quite some time. He's a talented player. He's a four-star according to 247 ESPN and Rivals. Rivals has him ranked as the number 57 player in the country. I had Anthony Saka rated as a borderline top 50 player as a sophomore. He dropped a little bit as a junior. I'll explain that why, but this is still a really good borderline top 100 football player that I think is going to jump back up as a senior. Again, I'll break all that down later. But this is a big pickup also because this is one that Notre Dame wanted. Notre Dame offered Anthony Saka back in December of 2021. This is right after Marcus Freeman had been hired as the head football coach. And I believe he got offered before Al Golden was hired as the defensive coordinator. So obviously there's going to be a lot of talk about the Al Golden, Tony Saka connection. And just so you guys who don't know this, Anthony Saka is the son of Tony Saka, who played quarterback at Penn State back in the late 80s and 1990 and was the starting quarterback for the Nittany Lions when Al Golden was their starting tight end. For those older folks like myself who are still a little ticked off at at Tony Saka for that game-winning touchdown pass he threw to Al Golden in Notre Dame Stadium, uh, this one makes maybe makes you feel a little bit better because his son Anthony is going to be playing for Notre Dame. So there's that connection between Coach Golden and Coach Saka. However, if you go back and look when Anthony Saka was offered, he was offered before the that uh, Al Golden was hired as Notre Dame's defensive coordinator. So clearly, this is a guy that Marcus Freeman and Chad Bowden liked as well. But once Coach Golden got on board, obviously he was a a favorite of Al Golden. He was a young man that took uh, multiple visits in 2023, had actually not been back to campus in 2024. Uh, Obviously, his season went went very long. This was a back-and-forth affair. There was some talk. Obviously, Penn State was in it for a while. They kind of faded when Manny Diaz left. But that's why Duke was among his finalists. Uh, because Manny Diaz is now the head coach of Duke, and it was came down to Notre Dame, Alabama, Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Duke. The main players really at the at the end were Notre Dame, Ohio State, and Alabama. Alabama was a team that had had been recruiting him for a little bit. The new staff was pushing for him. Ohio State liked Anthony Sack. I don't know that they were in a position to take a commitment from him just yet. I think they're trying to let their linebacker recruiting play out. But Notre Dame, you know, was like, hey, we, we love you and we'll keep pushing for you. And this was a guy that that they really wanted. And so it makes a lot of sense to take him, brings a lot of positional versatility, which we'll dive into. But this is one that, look, when, you, when you're a coach and you invest a long time and a lot of work into a recruit, there's an extra sense of satisfaction when you finally get him. And this is a kid that Notre Dame has been in a good place for for a while, but it was one where you just, you know, you felt like you were always in the top two or three, but could you be number one? They were able to make that happen, and they won a, rec- a recruitment that really they've been been trying to land for a long time. So Anthony Saka is now in the class. We'll dive into a class impact after the interview, but I first want to play the interview that Anthony Saka did with Irish Breakdowns, Ryan Roberts, and Sean Davis. As always, as you guys know, StreamYard can be a pain, so I'm going to play this. And once I do, if you guys could just let me know that you can hear the sound, and then we'll be ready to rock and roll.
Welcome back to the newest edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. We have a special one for you all. Ryan Roberts joined by Sean Davis, co-host of the Lucky Lefty Podcast and recruiting analyst here at irishbreakdown.com. And we are also joined by the newest member of the Notre Dame 2025 recruiting class. We have with us Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, St. Joe's prep star defender. Play some safety, play some linebacker, obviously being recruited to play linebacker by a lot of great schools. Mr. Anthony Saka. Anthony, really appreciate you for taking some time, man. I guess the the first question for you is just a general one is, how does it feel to be Irish, man? It's been a long time coming, it seems. It feels great. Honestly, it feels great. You know, part of like, you know, the relief of the whole recruiting process kind of wrapping up. I mean, I've been getting recruited since I was a freshman. So I've been having coaches banging on the door for three years now. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad I, I came to the conclusion I came to. Well, I think that's a great point is that you have been obviously like you've been head into recruiting for a long time. How have you best because I know obviously your your dad was a great player in his own right. And I know he went through his own version of the recruiting process back in the day before he went to Penn State. But how were you able to just to navigate all the chaos? Because I know it can be a very daunting, tiring process. How do, how do you feel like you best handled it over the last couple of years? I mean, I think I did a good job kind of just not letting it over consume my entire life. Like I, I kind of had like this switch. All right, it's football time and it's relaxed time. It's me time. It's like, I get to spend time with my family because I mean, with my schedule, at least football wise, I don't get to see my family as much. So I kind of just like to leave the football stuff at, I leave the football stuff at school. And then at home, I, I try not to talk about football as much, or I try to just, you know, just have quality time with my family, I would say. So I, I feel like that's, probably the best way that I did it with football being so ingrained in your life from the time that you came into existence I guess when you finally made the call and told Notre Dame that you were going to commit and you hang that phone up everything you've gone through blood sweat tears like what is your exact emotion at that moment is it jubilation is it like relief and then how did your dad react when you let him know that you were ready to commit? I was kind of like over the last couple of weeks, I wouldn't say like I was like stressed out, but like I was thinking a lot. I was in meetings with my coaches a lot. I was sitting down with my my dad and my mom kind of just hashing out like where do, where do we want to go? Like what is, what's the best decision for me? Because when you get to like this point, like all these schools, there's no bad decision. It's what's the best decision. Like, what's the best decision for you personally? And when I told my dad, I got a, I got a good job and a handshake, which is the most I'll, pro- I'll probably get out of my dad. So, I mean, I'll, I'll take it. And uh, that, that's probably what I'll, I'll hold on to the most. Well, and I was going to ask, Anthony, is just from the family's perspective, maybe this is more from a mom's perspective for a second. I, I mean, I'm sure your dad has some, like, initial just kind of thoughts on it. But you having to navigate so many great schools. I mean, you had Alabama in your final five. You had Ohio State. You had Duke. You had Wisconsin. You had a lot. I mean, dad's alma mater was recruiting you, obviously, for a yeah. very long time as well. Just with the decision to go to Notre Dame, I guess from a family's perspective, how, I, I, I guess, pro Notre Dame were they? Like, were they a big were they a big advocate of you ending up with the Irish? Like what was just kind of their thoughts around Notre Dame in general from a family perspective? I mean, my dad kind of kept his own opinions like tight to the vest. Like he didn't let, like he wanted it to be my decision at the end of the day. My mom was like, I don't, I don't care. I'll go wherever, where are we, where are we going this week? Like she was like, all right, wherever we're going, I'll be there. Uh, I will say like my aunt and my uncles and all of them, they were, they came out with me to, Ohio, the Notre Dame Ohio State game and they loved it and they were pro Notre Dame I, they never voiced it but they I, I I always knew it they were super ecstatic when I when I broke the news to them on on Monday night they were they were very they were very excited about it and kind of like the funny thing was like I was out to dinner with my grandparents yesterday and they both wanted my dad in the worst of ways to go to to go to Notre Dame like they were nice. so no they were so Notre Dame and my dad didn't go there. So the kind of the joke was yesterday, it was like it took him 35 years, but there's probably there's finally a sack of gun in Notre Dame. It's funny because his dad, as he reminded me before we started the show, walked into Notre Dame Stadium not once, but twice. <laughs> it it, it came away with victory. So just off of that story alone, I'm glad your grandparents get to experience one of yeah. their dreams. 
through you. <laughs> yeah. That's a wonderful story. So moving forward and continuing that narrative for you in this entire journey through your recruiting, something stands out about all of the top schools, I'm sure, right? Yeah. And I'm sure you have guys and people that you connect with, recruiting coordinators and coaches that you have great relationships with. But for you, as you continue to move forward, knowing that you're going to Notre Dame, what gets you the most excited about finally getting there and finally experiencing Notre Dame? I would say getting coached by Coach Golden. I mean, I've, I've known him for the better half of three years now since I was a freshman, and we, we built a great relationship. I built a great relationship with uh, Coach Freeman, uh, Coach Fuller, who they just hired uh, full-time, but I knew him when he was a grad assistant. Uh, you know, just the whole coaching staff. And, it, like, it kind of the biggest point of my recruitment with my dad was, like, go where you feel comfortable and go where you're wanted. Like, go mm -hmm. go to – go. That, that was his two biggest points, in a sense. He was like, I don't care where you go, but these are the two things you should look at when you're looking for a school. Well, and going off that, Anthony, is is I when I kind of did a little bit of a commit preview, just kind of highlighting the schools that were on your final list – it seems like relationships came up a lot, right? Like yeah. you just mentioned Al Golden, obviously, Coach Freeman, the Notre Dame staff. But I even think of, you know, we, we talk about, I know Jim Knowles was a St. Joe's guy yeah. back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. I know that you obviously know James Laurinaitis from his time at Notre Dame a little bit. And I know also that Duke was on your finalist, and you obviously are very, very, like, you know Manny Diaz very well, yeah, obviously, yeah. for his time and at Penn State. Infante, Infante coached at my high school. He was the, uh, he was the head coach right before I got there. Yeah, so you have a lot of – obviously, you've built a lot of great relationships with several of these schools. I guess I'm curious of, like, the Notre Dame perspective because, I mean, for people that don't know, Al Golden obviously had played with your dad at Penn yeah. State, and I know that he's, you know, very familiar with your family, and you've been familiar with him for a long time. But more of my question is, when you talk about Notre Dame staff, you already mentioned Coach Bula, who was a big-time linebacker in the Big Ten, spent some time in the, SEC, I mean, in, in the NFL and coaching down in Alabama for a little bit before Notre Dame. You talked about Al Golden, who was literally a – linebacker coach for a team that played in the Super Bowl a couple years ago and yeah. now a great defense coordinator and coach Freeman who was a big time linebacker at Ohio State played in the NFL unfortunately his NFL career was cut short to injuries having so many great linebacker minds in the room at Notre Dame how attractive is that you, to you for a player that has played safety has played overhang has played linebacker and to really develop into the best possible linebacker you can be on the next level I mean it kind of all makes sense right like I'm going to have linebacker knowledge at my disposal in a way. And you got to like, you got to like the people that you're going to be around. Like you, I'm going to be spending more time with coach golden, coach Bulla, all these people that I'm going to be spending with my family over the next couple of years. So, I mean, sure. you don't have to, I mean, you got to love and you got to like them, but you got to respect them and respect their knowledge of the game in a way. And I know that when we're kind of looking for, well, I, actually, I would like to ask, because we talked a lot about the coaches and the relationships, Notre Dame's 2025 class has been very well known already. Deuce Knight is obviously the ringleader of yeah, this, yeah. of being relentless to help recruit this class. Yeah. How much, how much contact have you had just kind of with the other commits in the class so far and how, I guess, I don't want to say vital, but how how re reassuring was it for you to be able to know that these guys have been pushing for you for a while now? I mean, yeah, I've known, I've known Deuce for a while since he committed. I, I mean, we talked and then met with him, met with him in person for the first time on the Ohio state visit, uh, got added into the Snapchat group chat about a couple of days ago. So I've been talking, I've been talking to all the guys, uh, uh, Ethan long, one of my family friends, uh, his sister or someone played for my aunt at Quinnipiac, my aunt's head women's basketball coach at Quinnipiac, some along the lines of that. So I kind of just little connections, little connections all over the place at Notre Dame. Now, this is the second time he's mentioned the Ohio State game, so I have to go here because I have to feel like we feel, Ryan, that the 25 class, even before we get to signing day, the feeling is if Notre Dame finishes strong, this will be the best class then Marcus Freeman has brought in in his tenure as head coach in Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. That Ohio State game for a lot of people was an opportunity for Notre Dame to change the narrative. Yeah. To finally let people know we're here. We have arrived. Mm -hmm. Do you guys feel amongst the 25 group, we're the, we're the group yeah. that's going to get us over the hump? Yeah. Possibly finally hoist 
that national championship trophy? Is that something you guys talk about and you have an overall feeling that you guys I mean, are going to be the difference makers? Obviously, like, it's a, a thing we all want to accomplish together as a group. I mean, we brought in a great 2024 class, mm -hmm. a, bug, a bunch of big hitters in there, and then, you know, kind of just build a momentum off that where we're going to get a shot as a team, as a group, to do this thing, an expanded college football playoff. So, I mean, everyone gets a chance, even – you know, drop even if we do drop a couple of games, like we still do get a chance to go play. I mean, obviously the goal is to go undefeated and go win a national championship, but I mean, it's I think it's going to be a special place in South Bend, Indiana, if you got a if you got a college football playoff game going on in there. There's no doubt about that. And I, Anthony, I would love to ask you because I remember when Notre Dame first started recruiting you heavily. I watched your film for the first time, and you're playing single high free safety. I'm like, who the heck is this kid? Right, like a <laughs> six three kid that's moving like that. And then obviously as a junior, they're moving you around a little bit more. You're playing on the second level a lot. You're playing overhang. They're playing out in space, doing all the type of stuff. Can you talk to me about your development as a football player now becoming a guy that played a lot of safety early on in his career, but now becoming more of a second level difference maker? I mean, yeah. So my freshman and sophomore year, I was a I was a safety for majority of my snaps. I was I was a strong safety. Um kind of getting to see the field from a different point of view from 12 yards away. So I could kind of see everything, you know, just that that's kind of where it started. Uh, I actually, I played quarterback until I was in eighth grade. Like I played both ways, but I played quarterback until I was in eighth grade. Then I got here and my, my coaches don't like lefty quarterback. So I got, I got kicked out. <laughs> I got, I got kicked out to the defensive side because we needed some safety help. And then last year it was like, it was August and we haven't really, we didn't really find our third linebacker yet. So they're like, ah, oh, let's just throw the 225-pound kid that's standing 12 yards off the ball at the damn linebacker. Let's see what happens. So, I mean, did that. Got more comfortable as the season went on. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just about playing football. And I believe I'm a great football player at the end of the day. Wherever you put me on the field, I feel like I can make a difference, make an impact. So, I mean, that's like the most I'll say. And I feel like playing safety really helped me out coming down into the box and learning how to play in space and – kind of working on leverage in a sense and, you know, just like recognizing certain things because your vision gets more closed when you're closer to the line of scrimmage. But I feel like playing safety helped me out more, see the more majority of the field. Sean, you know, what's so ironic is that they threw him out for being a left-handed quarterback. And now Notre Dame has the best left-handed quarterback in the country in the 2025. <laughs> class, which is yeah. kind of funny, super uh, funny. And to be able to correlate, that really is a blessing because three positions that he played, I discipline is vitally important. Yeah. Like all three positions, right? Yeah. So that definitely has to help with your continued development at the, at the linebacker position. Mm -hmm. Even though, like you said, you're close to the line of scrimmage, but you've been dealing with eye discipline your whole life. Yeah. Football. So that has to be one of your strengths. What are your other strengths you feel like you bring to the table at the position? I feel like I can cover a lot of ground. I feel like wherever I'm at on the football field, I can always make a play. Uh, I think I'm versatile in ways defenses can use me in their scheme, whether it's blitzing off the edge, covering tight ends, covering running backs, dropping into coverage. I mean, I feel like I can do a lot. Well, and I would love to ask about like Notre Dame's pitch to you just positionally, because obviously they run a four, two, five defense. You mentioned playing a little bit of Sam. I mean, that's basically what the overhang position is yeah. at this point, playing against so many spread offenses, but so you have the ability, I think, because you mentioned you're 225 pounds. I mean, you could play Rover. You might develop into a Will. I mean, you might even be a playmaking Mike eventually. Like, who knows where you'll end up. What is Notre Dame's pitch to you as far as where they see you fitting positionally early on and where you might be heading down the road? So they call it a uh, combo backer in their defense. Kind of just – it's sort of what I do right now in my defense in a way. What what I want to do is I want to be on the field for all three, all three snaps. I want to be, I want to be a three down linebacker. I don't want to have to be taken off the field because I'm not able to cover a, a slot wide receiver or I'm not, you know, just certain formations. I can't be on the field. So, I mean, my goal is to, to essentially just stay on the field for all three snaps, but in all, cause they do run a lot of sub packages. So just finding my way on the field. Love it. Well, in, in uh, my last question, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sean, ask your question. I got no, one no, last no. one. You know, ask your question because we have to end it with my yes. question. So I, I'll let you. I'll let you go ahead, Anthony. You've been to Notre Dame a couple times. My last question was basically your experiences getting in South Bend. Okay, what was just kind of the initial pulse when you first got there? Because people always ask me what it's like in South Bend, 
and it's just very unique, right? Like it's kind of hard to explain. What have you, what has just been your just initial impressions of your couple times on campus and what it's actually like in South Bend? I mean, it's, it's beautiful. All the architecture, all the buildings, just walking around. I mean, it, it's definitely a unique feeling because it's a little bit smaller than other schools. I mean, but I think that's what makes it special out, out of Notre Dame, honestly. So Ryan, the reason yes. I said we have to end with this is because both of you guys are East Coast guys. You know, I'm just a simple. Yeah. I, just, I would like to say this, by the way, Sean. I would like to say this, by the way. It might say that Anthony's a Philadelphia guy, but I, in my book, he's a New Jersey guy because his family very roots are in Jersey. So, very yes. New Jersey. Uh, here we go. You're, so you're <laughs> always claiming the Philly PA guys up there, New Jersey. But no, in all seriousness, I suffer here in the Midwest because we don't play baseball. In Chicago, that well, yeah, I mean, we just don't historically, right? So, yeah. tell us the guys like you out there in the east coast that get to watch really good baseball on an annual basis. So, give me your top three, not best, but give me your top three must watch baseball players right now. Both top of you guys, three. top three, oh, both must of us? watch, yeah, both? yeah, the oh. must watch, must watch. I mean, I mean, I'll let Anthony think for a second. I mean, for me, like, I, I don't like the Dodgers, obviously, but Otani, what he's able to do as a two-way star, I mean, it's pretty incredible, right? Like, he would be one. I have to throw a Philly guy in there, so Bryce Harper, of course, one of the best players in Major League Baseball right now. And then, oh, man, a third. A third's kind of tough, man. Number three. Man. That's actually a great one. You know, you know who's um, – Ronald Acuna is – although I hate the Atlanta Braves, he is a pretty fantastic baseball player. Did that Walter hurt Ronald you to say his name? name? Did that hurt oh, you, it did. it did. It did. I hate the Braves with a burning passion, but yes, yes. <laughs> uh, i go Otani, Harper, and then Julio Rodriguez from the Mariners. Mm. Oh, Julio's a good one. Julio's a good one. He good is one. Cr- he has some crazy power for a guy that's not yeah. really even filled out yet. You know, like just so much torque. Well, Sean, somehow you ended the Irish Breakdown podcast with a baseball question. I don't know how you did that, sir. But that is a <laughs> yeah, good way. To I end knew it. that's my first love. I knew you guys are Phillies fans, and yep. both of you, I feel like I think both of you are going to a game this weekend. So, yep, Anthony will be there on Friday for the for the season opener for the Phillies. I will be there on Saturday. So, yeah, yes, only, I'm taking him a lot of baseball here. Very soon. I say I agree with you. The Dodgers do have a must watch guy, but for yes. me, it's always been Mookie. Oh, Mookie's great. Mookie's great. Yeah. Five nine and just fantastic. So, yeah. Dude, just he plays multiple positions. He's very similar to time. Yeah, it's, he doesn't pitch, but he plays multiple positions. Former MVP Bryce is definitely on my list. Dude, oh, that's I, great man. Dude, I would flip to it. Just his at-bats. Yeah. Just as soon as he gets to the plate, oh, I'm like, all right, I'm flipping. Sean, he has one of those. You remember when you watch Ken Griffey Jr.? We're going to end this after oh, yeah. this one. But, like, Ken Griffey Jr.'s swing was so pure. Bryce Harper's is too, man. Like, that thing is just a pure, pure swing. Just so yeah. natural. And then but, again, ending and the conversation here with newest member of the Notre Dame class, 2025, St. Joe's Prep in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, linebacker, Anthony Sackett. Mm-hmm. Anthony, congratulations again, man, and thank you so much for joining the show today, man. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Go Irish. So that is the interview that the guys did with Anthony Saka. Recorded that yesterday before the show. So Ryan today is actually probably at the Phillies game right now, I believe. I'm not sure what time it started, but... That's it. You guys got a chance to get a little bit of a sense of Anthony Saka and what he brings to the table and and just the kind of personality he has. You guys uh very, very confident young man, which is a good thing. I, I like football players that are confident, but not in a but in a proper way. So very, very happy to see Notre Dame get him. So we're gonna dive more into this breakdown. So I'm gonna first, you know, talk a little bit about the class impact and, and what landing Anthony Saka means for Notre Dame, what it does for Notre Dame. And looking at this 2025 class at linebacker, it was an interesting process because this is a loaded linebacker class nationally. And Notre Dame needed to tap into it. And there's still a lot of work to be done, but this is a big part of that. This is the first sort of, I would say, big time potential linebacker that they've gotten in this class. And so you needed to get some of that. And the reason when you look at kind of how linebacker recruiting has come since Marcus Freeman arrived, it's gone very, very well. I mean, Notre Dame, obviously, in 2022, had a very strong four-man linebacker class, landed another good group in 2023, 
a very, very strong three-man group, landed another strong three-man group in 2024. But in the 2022 group, you've seen some attrition. There's really only one linebacker left from that class at linebacker. Josh Burnham has moved down to defensive end. Jordan uh, Jr. to Amaka is playing Viper now. Uh, Nolan Ziegler is no longer in, with the program. And then you go into the next year's class. You have three guys the next year, three guys the next year. So Notre Dame is in a situation in this class where you know, they did need a third guy in this class. Potential to get to four if it's the right guys, but that's probably something that have to be determined more down the road at this point in time. But three right now is the target. And so you needed you were they were kind of looking for two things. Obviously, depth is important, but because of how well they've done in recent years, Notre Dame was looking needed to look for more impact. I shouldn't say what they have looked for, but they needed to look for more impact at, as far as just a pure off-ball linebacker. So I'm only counting Josiah Kia amongst the current commits at that position because Dominic Hulak's being recruited to play a different position. So you got Josiah Kia, solid player, still a little bit of an unknown, in my opinion, just because of the, the lack of film. The film I have seen is, is good, doesn't blow me away, but it's good. But I'm trying to hope reserve judgment until I can see more film of Josiah Kia. But, you know, not a guy that was really considered a, a you know, a, a high-level recruit. You know, we'll see how it pans out, but the staff really likes him. This is the next kid that they really targeted and that with Anthony Sacken. So you've got two guys that the staff has been on for a long time, two, two guys the staff pushed for early on. You can debate should they have pushed for this guy or the other guy, whatever the case may be. That's a fair discussion. That's more for down the road. But the fact is, is the staff very much wanted Josiah Key in the class and was very high on, on Anthony Saka as well. And now how he impacts the class has kind of evolved over the last year, in my opinion. So when I looked at Anthony Saka as a sophomore and then the guys talked about it, he was a safety his first two years and a really good one. Now, not a college safety, but a really good high school safety. And his game really, in his body, really projected more to start at Rover, and then maybe eventually he could grow into a will. Well, that kind of already started this past year. Anthony put on probably about fifteen. It looks to me, it looks like about fifteen pounds. Got bigger, moved down into the box. Now you look at him and you're like, okay, that's more of a pure box player now. Like you see that projection a lot more now, to where he looks more natural at the will position. In my view, potentially could be a you know, as he grows, develops a longer, taller version of J.D. Bertrand, you know, really athletic guy, but but obviously has more physical tools than what J.D. brought to the table, which we'll get into. So you've now got two guys that kind of project as like Rover Will types initially and Josiah Kia and Anthony uh, Saka. So Notre Dame now has a second player in the class, a linebacker, and what that's going to allow them to do, and we'll get into this a little bit later, is, is narrow their focus a little bit, narrow their board. But it also gives them, in my view, a guy that grades out as a minimum top 150 caliber player. As I said, Anthony's grade dropped a little bit for me on his junior film, which isn't completely unexpected. He added some weight to get to play linebacker. He's playing a position he's never played before. So you're going to see some things where like, well, he's going to have to work on that there. He's going to have to work on that there. He's going to need work there, need work there. You know, but there's a lot to, to focus on. But the ceiling is still very high, and that's why it was important. They needed to get a guy that had, was a high ceiling player that could be sort of an off-ball defender. I don't think this team needs a lot of rovers, to be honest with you, on the roster. And they got Teddy Rezac last year because they do so much 4-2-5 with, with more of a nickel personnel. Uh, we saw last year where the, the Rovers played, gosh, it was at least 100 to 150 snaps more. The two Rovers of Thomas Harper and then Clarence Lewis played at least 150 more snaps uh, than did the starting Rover and Jack Kaiser. So it's just less of that on the roster. So you don't need three Rovers or four Rovers on the roster like you might need Mike's or Wills. So you do have a young man in, in, in Anthony Saka that I think still can play some Rover in certain situations, especially as I, as he gets more used to the, to the body weight that he's added, but now a guy that projects more as an inside guy, which is there's greater need there. So I think as much as I loved Anthony Sack as a potential Rover prospect, I, I like the fit even more now as an inside guy. Cause I think that's where the greater need is. They need to continue stockpiling those inside linebackers uh, moving forward. So from a class impact standpoint, that's where he, he, fits in at linebacker. He's the 19th overall commitment in this class. He's the ninth defensive player in this class. 
third high school linebacker to commit to this class, second guy that projects as a pure linebacker in this class. I, I, I with Dom Hulak, I look at Hulak and, and say that's a guy to me that that shouldn't be counted as a linebacker, even though he's a high school linebacker, because there's a greater chance he moves to Viper than him moving to linebacker at the next level. So that's why I, I talk about there really just being two linebackers in this class. And when you look at the film breakdown, I'll just dive into that first before we actually pull up the film. So that way, just give you a sense of, of what I see in him and what you guys can look for as we dive into the film. First and foremost, you see a good frame. He's a long athlete. He's listed at 6'3". You see pictures of him with Marcus Freeman. Marcus Freeman's about 6'1", 6'1 and a half. He's a, at least an inch taller than Coach Freeman. It's more than an inch when you he's got very high curly hair. But just as far as like what his natural height is, he's at least an inch taller than Marcus Freeman, maybe an inch and a half. So the 6'3 that he's listed at is, is if he's not 6'3, he's close to it. Always had a frame that you like, the frame that could allow him to add weight and, and get bigger. And so you, you kind of saw, I, I always felt with, with Anthony Saka, I always saw sort of a Drew Tranquil-ish transition although he would make the move to to sooner than Anth who then drew who really didn't start making it till his what third fourth year of college drew started off off at safety at notre dame then moved but you know drew was a great safety in high school moved to rover in 2017 started there had a great year 80 plus tackles 10 plus tackles for loss great year there then finished his career at will and now he's playing line off ball linebacker in the national football league and was i think a early fourth round draft pick and I see a lot of similarities between Anthony Sack and Drew Tranquil. A lot of similarities. Similar body type, although Anthony's longer and a little bit taller. Uh, similar athletic profiles at the same level. Level. I think Anthony's a bit more smooth than Drew was, but Drew's a little bit more explosive, but very similar in both areas. It's hard not to look at Anthony Sack and not be reminded as a Notre Dame analyst of Drew Tranquil and the transition he made from safety to rover to will to the National Football League. And that's the thing that you like about Anthony is that length, that range, the athleticism is good. I thought it was excellent as a sophomore when you project to linebacker. He, he, he To me, it looked like he lost a little bit of a step from a pure speed standpoint as a junior. Some reasons I think that is. Number one, he added a decent amount of weight in one offseason. That sometimes, especially with younger players, can result in them losing a little bit of a step. Now, one of two things can happen and often does happen when you're talking about top-level athletes, which I think Anthony Saka is a top-level athlete, is they put on a decent amount of weight early and it takes their bodies a little bit time to kind of get used to that weight. And then once their body gets used to that weight, they physically mature, which means they get stronger in the lower body. Then all of a sudden the explosiveness comes back. And now you see that same type of explosive athlete, but just in a bigger package. And so that's my projection for Anthony. But I've said in the past, in, in recent months, that I didn't love his junior film as much as I loved his sophomore film. And, and that that's the reason right there is just that he just wasn't quite as fast. But he's still a very rangy athlete, very nimble athlete, You know, pretty good change of direction ability, a, a guy that's got good balance, a guy that shows you know, good natural strength. I think there's going to be more room in that regard for him to to get to even get stronger in the core areas, which to allow a, a little bit more pop when he arrives at a football. Always was a willing tackler, uh, good form tackler as well. You don't see Anthony often going high on guys. You don't see him being a guy that's that's going to go you know with tackles around the upper chest and neck area. You know, he knows to drive through the hips, the the, the lower parts of the body. Uh, does a really nice job of dipping and ripping when he's going through either blocks or uh, through ball carriers, which I like. And so there's a lot to like there, just the God-given abilities of size, length, and athleticism. But there's a couple other things about Anthony that, to me, differentiate, differentiate him from maybe some other players on the board. And it's two two parts about it. Number one is just the football IQ. I think the football IQ is outstanding. I mean, you watch a kid that just – you could especially see it at safety. There's two things that, that I that show it to me. Number one, at safety, he made great reads, was very instinctive, got his hands on the football a lot. He was not your typical – like he said, he was a strong safety. He's not your typical strong safety. I mean, he's undercutting seam routes. He's undercutting over routes and getting to the ball, making great reads, reading the quarterback effectively – 
And then to watch him make that transition to linebacker so seamlessly from an instinctive standpoint shows me that this kid knows, knows football. This kid just understands the, the game and his time playing safety allowed him to make a very smooth transition. And I know that like Sean and, and Ryan were talking about the, the, the somewhat similarities between him and Bodie Cahoon. Well, Bodie needed a year to really make that transition. I think Anthony made it a lot faster. Uh, and and that just comes down to just a guy that's got an incredibly high football IQ. So that's something that I like a lot. Number two, this is the last piece, and you'll see a little bit of this on film. His combination of length, athleticism, and range and instincts makes him a very, very good high school coverage player. And he has a chance to to take that to the next level. That, more than any other skill that he has, to me, projects extremely well to the next level and that's incredibly important in today's game 20 years ago i mean yeah, it's nice to have a guy that can cover now it's a must to have a, a six foot three 225 to eventually 235 pound linebacker that can play side to side like he does but has the coverage instincts that he does is really impressive and you'll see some of this on film you know he's got he's got man coverage instincts now will he be a guy that's going to go be playing slot receivers and man coverage? No. But a guy that can run with, has the length to play with tight ends, the instincts to play with tight ends, a very effective zone defender uh, it, it, with, with how Notre Dame will do their linebacker zones, the zone drops, you know, getting under the in cuts and the dig cuts, getting under the hook curl stuff. You know, you're trying to, you know, I'll have this on one of my Mike Denbrock breakdowns coming up here, which is on one of the premium breakdowns I do at Irish Breakdown or the boards at IrishBreakdown.com. But Coach Denbrock loves throwing those vertical reads that either go vertical or if they play off, you, you snap it back on, on stops or in comebacks. And having a linebacker, especially a will, because they do a ton of that in the boundary, having a will that's got the range to see pass and open up and get underneath those deep outcuts, those deep comebacks, those deep stop routes, those deep outcuts uh, is, is important. Having a guy that can open up and run with a really athletic tight end. So if Notre Dame's playing a Georgia or playing somebody like Notre Dame and teams like that have those really athletic rangy tight ends, this is a kid that is a will can run with them. And then if you get into some teams that maybe have that, but they have more bigger personnel, you could actually go to a three linebacker look, kind of make him a Rover Sam type of player, and he can still do those things in those type of matchups. So he does a lot of things in that regard that are uh, that really impressive. You don't see a ton of success from him as a blitzer, as a junior. They didn't ask him to do it a ton. Uh, I, it's also something that takes a little bit of time. When we saw that at Notre Dame in 22 and 23, how much better guys that were seniors in college got from senior year to fifth year with J.D. Bertrand and Maris Leofau when they were asked to blitz a lot more than they had earlier in their careers. And this is a young man that was playing safety. So just the timing of it, the technique of it are things that I think are going to need to catch up. But the athleticism is there. He'll he'll the things like block destruction needs improvement. You know, footwork needs to be refined. All the technical parts need to be improved, as we always expect from from younger players. But he's the kind of kid that has all the tools to get there. It's just about learning the nuances of the position. And so once that happens, I expect also the blitz aspect of what he can do to really take off. Like it's not there now, but I'm projecting him to be a really effective blitzer. If that comes, you're talking about a kid that's as one of the better all around linebackers on the board. Maybe there's guys that are more explosive and dominant and physical against the run. And maybe there's some guys that are, that are rangy and explosive in space, but this is a young man that's incredibly comfortable in space a young man that's that's very instinctive against the run, makes great reads and coverage, and is a guy that has potential to be an impact blitzer. You see that all around skill set, and then if eventually he he grows into a Mike, which I don't even say grows into it, but let's say he gets up to two thirty, and they say, "Hey, look, you're going to be our Mike, and we're going to have somebody. You know, J Kingston's going to be a Will or Nathaniel Usu Botang if they can get him or." Madden Fair Emo, the other guys on the board, or guys that are currently on the roster, Jaden Allsbury, whatever. Now you really, it's plus plus with his coverage ability as a Mike is now plus plus because now he's running with tight ends and running backs and dropping under the deep middle zones. And he projects to be really good at that stuff. And not just athletically, but incredible instincts and in coverage. That's what playing safety for two years really helped him combine with just a natural high football IQ. So when I look at the film, those are things that I see a lot to where I say, yeah, I didn't love the film quite as much as I did as a sophomore, 
but you still see some things where if that speed gets back to where it was before, this kid's going to skyrocket back up to being a top 50 caliber player, which is where I had him as a sophomore. Now it's about, it's borderline top 100 now, you know, maybe 100 to 125 now, which is where his grade is now. But I love the tools. His upside is not taking a dip at all. There's a lot to work with there when you're talking about Anthony Saka. So that's me kind of breaking down the film. Now I want to just actually give you guys a chance to watch them yourselves. And so I'm going to bring Anthony. Uh, we're going to bring some film up here now and, and give you guys a chance to watch this with me. So let's have a little bit of fun going through Anthony's film. Uh, you guys are going to enjoy this. This is a really good football player. Now, let me just say this too, before we dive too deep into this. Another thing that I like about him is I, I've said in the past, I don't care like, I'm not going to punish a guy who played against bad competition. I, I I I think there's too much of that. Like, well, this guy played against bad. I've seen enough Golden Tates and Harrison Smiths and guys like that to Amir Carlisle's that played against really mediocre competition to bad competition in high school. And they were great players. And I've seen guys like Javon McKinley played against elite competition and didn't translate as well. But if I have a choice, I always like that. And the thing about Anthony Sack is – this is a kid in the last couple of years has played against IMG. He's played against Lakeland. He's played against St. Thomas Aquinas, Gonzaga, and of course the best teams in the state of Pennsylvania. And he stands out every time he's on the field. This is an example of him in coverage. You can see him just really loose hips, opens up well, makes a nice read, taking a nice over the top angle, sees the ball get thrown inside, reacts to it quickly and gets over to make the interception. That's uh, yes, you got to be an athlete to make this play, but you got to be really smart and instinctive and make great reads to also make this play. And you can see that from Anthony throughout his film. A guy that just is a really smart and instinctive football player. You see the length on this particular play, he is all over this wheel route. They're trying to get him and, and be aggressive. He's all over it, runs with it, finds the football. I mean, this is a linebacker. This is a kid who's now about 6'3", 220, 225 pounds. Seeing that wheel route, staying on top of it. As soon as that guy looks for the ball, watch when he starts to look up. You can see he's looking at Anthony. Now he turns back to the ball, and, and what Anthony's doing here is he's reading his eyes. Not his head, but his eyes. When that guy's eyes go up, Anthony knows he found the football, and he turns around, finds the football, makes an interception. This isn't just a, a, a impressive physical play but this is a very impressive instinctual play that i really like uh that what i saw from anthony this year here's another clip of him you see the range sideline range you see him close and speed you'll see him coming in motion with the jet sweep sees it very you see the long strides there he doesn't necessarily look like he's super fast there but he is covering a ton of ground in a hurry on that play and just blows it up at the sideline Arrives at the ball with a little bit of force. He's not a super, super powerful player, but again, neither was Drew Tranquil. And, uh, you know, he was a very, very good tackle. You know, length was an issue, but very good tackler. This is against IMG. You can see his instincts again here. Ball gets fumbled. Anthony picks it up, runs it back for a touchdown. Their only loss last season was a three-point loss to IMG. They beat Lakeland by three touchdowns. So this is a very, very good program. It's a really good read here. You, you might want to say, like, hey, maybe get over top of this block, but, you know, that's a technical thing. But he reads it immediately, gets downhill, smooth athlete, makes the tackle, drives the guy down. You see, I mean, he's, he's a tall kid, and this running back is not real tall. And he does a nice job of really getting low when he arrives at the ball carry and making that tackle. It's a good sound tackler. It's a good football player. Here he is here playing Will. He's always communicating. Like there's a lot here that a linebacker's coach is going to want to improve upon. He's kind of flat foot a little bit early, doesn't necessarily get through the trash effectively, but you can see him read it though. That's the thing. It's like, this isn't like a great highlight reel play physically, but he knows exactly where this ball is going. And he steps over there, gets where he needs to get to. You can coach all the other stuff. You can coach the footwork, the angle, all that stuff. But the instincts is a much, much harder to, to, um, to really teach from a player like this. I believe this is also against IMG. This is a short yardage situation. You can see him coming off the edge here. Ball bounces. He gets outside with it. Kid's a really good football, but really you can see the instincts, right? You can just, he's just a natural mover. Again, there's some things here where I'd say, Hey, look, 
against better competition, you're going to want to get this thing outside. And and this is a technical thing where I'm correcting this because you've got help inside. See, the inside linebacker with him is got he's the inside pursuit. You can't allow yourself to get sealed off outside. You can't. So that's why I say, and and, and technically, I need to work on this. But he's so quick to make the read and get downhill that he's still able to make the play. So again, as you as you heard me say, there's a lot of things technically needs to work on. A lot of things, you know, weight room still needs a lot of work. But man, it's hard not to like how smart this kid is. And then you see the range, you see how well he gets downhill, and look at him sniff out that screen that uh, cross route from the top. He's dropping into coverage here, sees that, drives downhill, makes a play on it. Smart football player, smart football player. And there's, like I said, there's a lot of technical things, but this is a kid who's really playing linebacker for the first time. So you expect there to be a lot of technical things, but this right here, this getting downhill like this, getting across, getting downhill and just blowing this play up that you can't teach. Can't teach six, three, can't teach speed, can't teach instincts. Those things are just, you know, God gave this young man, those things. And now your job is to build up the strength, build up the body, build up the technical repertoire and make him a top player. But he's got all the tools you want to be a top player. Again, he's going in motion here, reads it, boom, gets outside, makes the play. So there, again, a lot to like, a lot to like here from him. Here's over the slot. Now, you do a lot of this. I don't see that. Right here, technically, this is, this is not very good. I mean, he's flat-footed. The guy's coming at him, he's flat-footed. But he's so long and athletic that he can still make this play. And so you're, you're like, well, he looks a little slow here. Yeah, because he's going from zero miles, like literally standing still to trying to run with a slant route. That I can fix. And if I can fix it, you know Max Bulla, now Golden Marcus Freeman, can fix it. But you, the, the, the range, the length, the athleticism, the instincts to not wrap his hand around that guy and, and get called for PI, to take the angle underneath and break it up, those things are much harder to teach. So he has that. That's the things you want to see on film. Any coach worth a grain of salt can teach the technical stuff. You want the guy that has the, the talent, the ability like this. I've actually coached at this stadium, by the way. It's a very strange stadium. But this is a very smart, instinctive player. Gets downhill in a hurry. They're trying to run a screen here, and he absolutely blows it up. They're fortunate that it was dropped. It's another play against IMG. You got to like the instinctual part and the fact that he can run. Here he is all over the back. Nice job staying outside. Closes quickly on the quarterback. Smart. So what what do I like about this play? Number one, he reads it, sees the back going out all over it, keeps his eyes on the back to the quarterback, gets off the the block, gets out to the football. A lot of good things to like about this young man. Just all over the football. Just all over the football. They, his team in 14 games this year only gave up 133 points. So he he understands what it's like playing as part of a great defense. And so he's going to come here with a very high standard. Here's IMG trying to run a screen on him. Sees it a little bit late, but he's not committing downhill. He sees pass, so he gets his eyes. He's looking, even though I think he maybe is a second late seeing it, he sees it relatively quickly. And he knows it's coming. And the fact that you he is a second late, that guy beats him. But you kind of see the ability to, to, to speed to catch the guy from behind. So this is another thing that technically I'm going to improve upon this. But the 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 instincts and the, the athleticism are things that you like. And, again, you're watching him against IMG Academy making, you know, making plays. And, and that's without really great sound technique. And you, you, you have to like those things. Here he's coming to a far sideline. He is – and here he's the – over top of number three to the right, and he's going to make this play on the backside. You can see the instincts. Very rangy player. Good play on the side. This is against Lakeland. This is down in Florida. So they're going down to Florida to play. Sitting, Getting to the hole, goes low, makes the tackle, beats the guard to the spot. Guard's trying to pull and kick him out. Has no chance. Blows it up. It's another very good play from Anthony Sacco. And as I said, plays against very, very good competition. Trying to run a little hook and ladder here. Doesn't read it great, but watch that hip flip. Watch this. That right there to turn and run, that's a really impressive athletic play right there. Like that is not normal. 
especially for a six foot three guy. So those are the things that you see on film that you're like, boy, the tools are there for him to be a really good football player. He's just got some technical stuff to learn. Once he does, he's got a chance to be a really, really good football player. Really good football player. Yeah, and Philip Roy Ball says he's he'll definitely have his, has technical things to work on, but you love his knowledge and instincts. Absolutely. And those are things that are harder to teach, Philip. So that's why you really get excited about the the that part of it because th- those things are there, plus the athleticism and the length are there. So that package is already there. The other stuff, Max Bull is going to be able to talk to teach. As you guys can see here too, he's not a punishing hitter, but as I said, neither was Drew Tranquil. He's going to be able to, as he gets older and stronger, you're going to see him deliver a lot more, you know, just pop at the point of attack. But he's never going to be like Manti, but you don't need him to be. That's not why you're recruiting him, to to, to be a, a punishing Mike linebacker that's just going to, you know, do nothing but highlight real hits. So that's the film of Anthony Saka. So the final piece of this, of this breakdown of Anthony Saka, again, very big pickup for Notre Dame. The final piece of this is going to be looking at what's next. And so here's where Notre Dame is at. Right now, the plan is to take one more linebacker. Depending on who they, where they stand with certain guys, I could see them getting to two. So, for example, if, if there's another linebacker on the board that they just feel like they have to have and they get that guy, and they're, I, would, I would expect them to, let's say it's not Nathaniel Usu botang I fully would expect them to continue recruiting him in hopes of adding him as well. But right now, the target number is one. Landing Anthony Saka has has gotten the staff in a position where now they're going to look and say, hey, listen, we're, we're, we're going to focus on a smaller list of players. And so we had this intel piece on the board yesterday. Uh, if, you'd have, if you're a member of the board, you would have seen this yesterday. It's just another reason why it's, it's good to be a premium member at boards.irishbreakdown.com. We explained to you that there's a lot of players on the board that their name has dropped, including Christian Jones, who had a visit coming up. That's been canceled. There's There's been some other guys, Anthony Delorier, that have been dropped. And really what you're going to see them focus on moving forward is, is really a group of four linebackers for now. Obviously, things can always change. But for now, the guys to really keep an eye on in this linebacker class are Nathaniel Wusu botang obviously, Madden Ferimo, Noel McHale, and Gavin Nix. Those are the four that you're going to see the staff really focus on to close this thing out. Because they're, if they don't get another linebacker, it's not ideal, but it doesn't crush them. Because they did get two back-to-back three-man classes, and you've got Kahano Kia back with three years of eligibility left, who's technically, based on eligibility, more like a 2020 three signee than he is a 2021 signee so you've got nine guys with multiple years of eligibility still on the roster at a position at a at a position where you're really it's a two-man position half the time and and that's what we have to understand as we rethink numbers is this is not a you need three to four deep at three positions that's not really how it works anymore in Notre Dame's defense because if you're going to count that then you need to count the guys that are rover, are nickels as part of the depth chart because they're going to man that position more so, honestly, than the rovers. The only way I see that changing is if they get a guy who is a who is like a Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa, who's just that twitchy elite space linebacker. Then, of course, you would uh, you would just shift and adjust and, and play him more. But more often than not, you're going to see this defense be more two linebacker oriented, and then a third about half the time and maybe less than half the time. So you have three linebackers in the 23 class, three linebackers in the 24 class. Kahanu Kia, for for our discussions, we all need to view him like a 23 signee from an eligibility standpoint. And then, of course, you've got uh, Josiah Kia, now Anthony Sack in this class. So if they don't get a third, then it's not ideal, but it, it's not, oh my gosh, how are they going to fill the linebacking core moving forward? So that's why I think they're, comfortable shortening the board right now because you've got Anthony Saka. So it was basically Anthony Saka, Christian Jones, those guys. It was sort of like, hey, who's the first one that wants to come? Anthony Saka was, which is what I think their preference was among those three, to be honest. Now their focus is on let's go out and get the dudes, like the real game changers. And that's what they're focusing on now. So I I actually don't have a huge problem uh, with them dropping guys like Delorier and, and Christian Jones, who I liked a lot, uh, but I, I, I'm comfortable with this decision. I have another decision that they decided to make 
that I'm not going to talk about now that that's more of the Viper concern. Uh, but we'll talk about that down the road that I'm not not real happy about at this point in time, to be honest with you. But that's not really a linebacker problem. That's more of a Viper problem. And so I'm completely on board with Notre Dame. Uh, we're talking about Marco Jones uh, in that regard. I- I'm totally fine with Notre Dame not recruiting Marco Jones anymore as a linebacker. Totally fine with it. I think it's a really big mistake not to be recruiting him anymore as a Viper. I, I think it's a very big mistake. But that's a whole different conversation for another day. Um, and, and when you talk about what's next, that's really where it's at. And then also we had a super chat from Alan uh, Watson, who to, it's sort of a what's next question, but not some, necessarily linebacker. He says, whom would you like to commit next? Congrats to the Saka family and welcome to the family. Can't wait for the season to start and hearing here come the Irish. So I'm going to look at this question twofold, Alan. Number one is overall, who would I like to be the next commit? And for me, it really comes down to one of the corners. I want Notre Dame to land Mark Zachary and Dallas Golden. That is a must, 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 must in this class. It is vitally important that Mike Mickens get that job done and the Notre Dame staff get that job done. Getting one of them in the class, I think, gets the ball rolling a little bit. So I'd like to see either Zachary or Golden. I, I would, I, I would, I believe that Mark Zachary is probably the closest to committing. And so that one obviously would be a good one, but I'd like to see one of those two corners jump on board uh, would to be the next commitment. And then the second part I could look at this, Alan, is if you're asking about linebacker, you know, who would I like to see be the next commitment linebacker? With the guys that are on the board, I'm kind of good with all of them. It's it's a win win win. Noel McHale, you guys know I love Noel McHale as a player. I, I I don't know how much of a shot they have with him right now. There's a lot of work to be done. Same with Madden Fair Emo. Nathaniel Wusu Botang, very early infancy of his recruitment. Notre Dame is in the game. They got to get him back on campus, but he's a guy that's talked about not committing till December, maybe even February. So a lot of work to be done there. But if they're only going to get one more linebacker, I mean, he'd probably be the guy that I would want because I do think there's a little bit of rover to his game, but he's just a different type of athlete, just that real twitchy, explosive type of athlete that can play inside. I mean, you could see a scenario where if, if Nathaniel Wusu Botang and Anthony Sack are starting linebackers in Notre Dame down the road, that Anthony Sack is your Mike and Nathaniel Wusu Botang's your Will. And that's a really rangy athletic group of linebackers. But at the end of the day, Alan, with the guys on the board for Notre Dame, Nathaniel Wusu Botang, Madden Ferimo, Noah McHale, and Gavin Nix, you can't go wrong. They're they're very they're different in a lot of ways, but they're all excellent linebackers. And so I think Notre Dame would be in great shape if they're able to get any of those guys. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. So that's breaking down the no McK- or the excuse me the Anthony Saka commitment, uh, big one for Notre Dame, right? This is a big commitment for Notre Dame. I've talked about you know, my thoughts of him as a player and not liking him as much as I did as a sophomore. But understand me correctly on this one. No, I don't grade him as high as I did as a sophomore. But he's a top top hundred caliber player, and that's a big pickup. And the thing that hasn't changed is the ceiling. I have to evaluate him differently now that the film is different and the position is different and those type of things, but it's still really good. And a lot of stuff is, you know, the technical stuff and improving the technique here, improving in there. Those things are all there. This is a kid with four and a half star upside. That's that of a top 50 player. So that's all I've said this before. That's what I care more about. I care more about the upside than I do where he is now. And with how deep Notre Dame is at linebacker, I don't really care that much about floors at linebacker in this class. You always like to have a floor and a ceiling in one player. And I think the floor for Anthony Sack is still pretty good. It's it's just the ceiling is is where I get excited about this kid. Even though there's things about his technical game I showed on film, you know, just want to see him get a little bit more of that burst back. But guys, this is still a really good football player and a really good pickup for Notre Dame and a guy that you won a battle that you've been going over two years to try to win. And that's always, that's always a big thing. So very, very good pickup for Notre Dame today, getting Anthony Saka and adding him to the class number 19 in the class of 2025, which ranks number one. So that's going to do it for this show. Uh, We're going to have more to talk about on the message board. Going to have, I might do a show later tonight or, or early Monday talking about Clarence Lewis and his decision to leave and how, you know, that impacts the the depth chart and the secondary things along those lines. But we'll also be back Monday with a mailbag at irishbreakdown.com. Uh, tomorrow, though, we'll be off because tomorrow's Easter. So I want all of you uh, who, who celebrate it, and I know I certainly do, uh, to, to have a wonderful Easter and remember what this season is about. 
And it's not about candy and bunnies. It's about the resurrection of our Savior. So um, it's a very important day for me and for all those who recognize it as well. Enjoy it. Remember what that day's about. Remember how blessed we truly are. And we'll be back on Monday. They're ready to get back after it on the Irish Breakdown podcast. So hit that like, hit that subscribe, hit the notification bell, share this podcast, give us a five-star review. If you have not checked out the breakdown videos at boards.irishbreakdown.com, I'm telling y'all, you're going to love this stuff. It's all 22 film. It's me talking through different run schemes. The most recent one is run schemes and just really diving into that stuff. People say they want to learn that stuff. You are going to get that on the boards. I got a lot more coming down the pike. I'm going to have more specific breakdowns, like breaking down inside zone, using film, Going to have some breakdown of the next stuff I'm working on is Coach Denbrock's pass offense. Going to have about four or five videos breaking all that stuff down. You're going to love that stuff. But that's only going to be on the message board at boards at irishbreakdown.com. So if you're not a member, perfect time to sign up, everybody. Definitely check that out, boards at irishbreakdown.com. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thanks for joining me. And we'll talk to you again here very soon on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.